Please turn, if you would, now on the back of your hymnals to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 18, on page 24 in the back. There's a lot of questions. I think there's one, two, three, four questions. I'll read the bold, and then I'll read along with you in the finer print. What do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? That Christ, while his disciples watched, was lifted up from the earth into heaven and will be there for our good until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. But isn't Christ with us until the end of the world as he promised us? Christ is true man and true God. In his human nature, Christ is not now on earth. But in his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is not absent from us for a moment. If his humanity is not present, wherever his divinity is, then aren't the two natures of Christ separated from each other? Certainly not, since divinity is not limited and is present everywhere. It is evident that Christ's divinity is surely beyond the bounds of the humanity he has taken on. But at the same time, his divinity is in and remains personally united to his humanity. And the last question, how does Christ's ascension into heaven benefit us? First, he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ, our head, will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. Third, he sends his spirit to us on earth as a further guarantee. By the spirit's power, we make the goal of our lives not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is sitting at God's right hand. I invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Focus of the sermon will be on 1 through 7, and then the end of that section, but we'll be reading 1 through 18. Sorry, 1 through 18, Gospel of John. A few weeks back, I had my last opportunity to speak with Jan Hale uh, in the hospital, and I had a couple of passages I was thinking about reading to her at that visit, but I asked her, uh, is there a passage that you would like to hear read? And she said, yes, I'd like to hear John 14. So uh, today we'll read this passage, uh, the last passage I was able to read to Jan and make a few comments about, but I'll be making more comments about it to you this morning. So John 14, uh, 1 through 18. <clears throat> Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. 
Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let us pray. We ask now, Holy Father, that your Holy Spirit now would, through the proclamation of thy word, bring great comfort and strength to the hearts of thy people from the word of God, from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what does a soldier who is serving in another country, and a college student that's in another state, and a little boy who's spending his first summer camp at camp, all have in common. <laughs> they long for the comforts of home. They all feel like they're orphans, alone in a way. So what do we do? We send that letter to the soldier. As he reads the words of his wife, his sister, mother, it's like they're right there with him. We send the box of old clothes that he likes to wear, or the baked cookies to the college student as he bites in, he thinks of mom's kitchen. There she is in her apron. And for a little guy that's doing his first stint in camp, we secretly mail off his favorite blanket or stuffed animal to hide at night and to remind him what it was like to be tucked in. When disruption and distance sets in, we long for the comforts of home. And so in our text here this morning, they are in the upper room. It tells us in John 13, verse 21, that Jesus himself was troubled in spirit. He came as light into this world. But now darkness was beginning to settle in as he sent out Judas Iscariot, and it was night. He who is light was beginning to become as it is put out. The darkness was crouching in. The darkness was coming to put out the light. And Christ knew that he was to be removed from his disciples. He knew that the cross would place him even further away from them as the dark judgments of God's wrath would fall upon him in their behalf. The cross would mark his removal away from his disciples. For over three years, he was with them. They were with him. But now he is declaring to them, troubled in spirit, knowing that their hearts would be troubled and discouraged deeply that he was going away. He was leaving. And it's in this very reality of Jesus' departure that he comforts them. He comforts them. That even though he is leaving by way of the cross back to the Father, he will be returning from home 
to them himself. You won't be left in the dark. You won't be left alone. Jesus will comfort them with the comforts of home, even while they are away from home. And this same comfort that Jesus speaks here to his disciples is the very same comfort he gives to all of his disciples while they are away from the Father's home, their true home. The comfort that he is coming. The comfort that he is coming in the Holy Spirit. First, comfort for the trouble. Verse 1 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believed in God. Now believe in me. I'm about to tell you something. You've been believing in God all along. That's good. You've been trusting, looking. It's because of God you've been following me. But now I'm going to tell you something at this difficult juncture that I need you to believe in. Because if you do believe in it, it will comfort your hearts. And so in chapter 14 here, this core thought that he is going away. He is going away to secure heaven as their home. And yet he would bring heaven back to them and return to them in the Holy Spirit. And that would comfort them. You're troubled. But don't let yourself be troubled. You've believed in God. Now believe in what I am telling you. Believe what Jesus is saying. Who told them that after these three years in which they took a big detour from their careers in life, fishermen, tax gatherers, or other careers that they were absorbed in trying to make a living, that it's not all over. Yes, Jesus is leaving town. That's difficult. But he wishes to assure them that though it will trouble their hearts deeply at the loss of having him, he would comfort them. Halberg Catechism, question number 46, says, What do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? That while his disciples watched, he was lifted up from the earth into heaven. That's exactly what happened. Acts chapter 1. Just as he said, I'm going to go. And John wants us to understand he's going by way of the cross. The cross will be his entryway and leaving and going to heaven. They watched him go. He's gone. But Jesus left them with a promise. He left them with a promise that even though times would be tough, even though I would no longer be there, hang on. I'm coming to you. Jesus promised that he would come for those who felt like they were orphaned. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He ascended to heaven to secure heaven, <laughs> to secure, as it is called here, the Father's house with many dwellings. Translated many rooms here in the ESV. It's the home of the Father. It's where the children belong. The children belong at home with the Father. Because there it's very roomy with rich accommodations. People wonder is there a heaven? Is there a place like that after death? 
Is there a place like that? Will there be when this world is over? When it's all said and done? The answer from Jesus Christ. The very one who initially came from heaven and then ascended back into heaven. If anyone would know, he should know. He's been there. He's gone back there. The answer is yes. There is a heaven called the Father's house where all his children have dwelling places with him. It is not of this earth. But when Christ comes back, when he comes back in the end of time, he will bring his children and gather them together and bring them into the heavenly reality. And earth itself will be heavenized, a new creation. But until then, until then, heaven is above and earth is here below. And there should be no doubt that heaven is a place where the humanity of Jesus Christ presently resides, along with the spirits of just men and just women made perfect. In the midst of myriads of angels, that's where Christ in his humanity is. As Catechism question 47 says, in his human nature, Christ is not now on earth. He is in heaven. He's not here. But he is there. We have a man in heaven. And Christ told them that by way of the cross, he was going away. He was moving away from them to the cross and then to heaven. But not only was he going there to secure a place for them that they would know is their home by way of that cross. But that Jesus Christ would also return from heaven. But the cross was necessary. Christ was righteous in and of himself. We read in Psalm 24, didn't we, that that the righteous king of glory ascends upward to the hill of the Lord and he's welcomed into the heavenly regions. Why? Because of his righteousness. But why did Christ have to go to heaven by way of being lifted up on the cross in order to get there? Why is that? It wasn't for himself. <laughs> it was for you and for me. Entering heaven requires righteousness. That's simple enough. <laughs> and no one gets to heaven unless they're perfectly righteous. And so Christ had earned. He had, as it was, kept the covenant of works before the Father so that in his high priestly prayer, he could say, Father, I've accomplished all the work you've given me to do. Now glorify me with the glory I had before. Christ had finished perfect obedience. In John chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you carries out the law. But Jesus said of himself, There is no unrighteousness in him. There's only one righteous man, Jesus Christ. And he claimed for himself as the one sent from God that not only that he was positively righteous, but that there was no unrighteousness in him. He was innocent. Holy, undefiled, and consequently separate from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He had earned it. Jesus was always obedient. Jesus accomplished the will of the Father to the very end, even to the point of the cross where Jesus at that last moment, though waffling in his own humanity back and forth, is there another way, Father? No. Then yes. In his final act of obedience. But that's only half, you see. That's only half. There's a reason why the cross itself was absolutely necessary if Jesus is to bring us along with him. Not only do we need a perfect righteousness, but we need forgiveness. And so our Lord Jesus Christ went to heaven by way of the cross 
that he might bear for us our sins in his own body on the tree, Peter says. Peter went by way of the cross so that he could be, as John 1.29 states, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist said. Or as the Apostle Paul said it, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. See, as a guilty sinner, as guilty sinners, we need two things. We need perfect righteousness. And Christ achieved that perfect righteousness in his last act of obedience, accepting the cross. But we also need complete forgiveness. Complete. How can that be? Full atonement can it be? Is the question the hymn we sing? The answer to that is a resounding yes. For Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. There is a complete forgiveness secured in the cross of Jesus Christ so that by faith in Christ and what he's done culminating in the cross, perfect righteousness, sin-bearing suffering, I too can have my sins forgiven and stand righteous before God. I too can have a home in heaven. See, that's what he's done. He secured a home in heaven for his disciples. And as he says in John 17, for all those who believe in, in their word, that is the preaching of the apostles, is found in the New Testament. You've heard the question, haven't you? Why should God let you into heaven? How would you answer that question? Why should God let you into heaven? How would you answer that question? We have the answer before us. Because Jesus Christ has borne my sin. Not a single one is held against me. And because Jesus Christ in his perfect righteousness has imputed it to me and therein has swung open heaven's gates, not only for himself, the righteous man, but for all those imputed with his righteousness. Praise God. Christ must go away though. He must abandon them. He must ascend by way of the cross into heaven and leave them behind. I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, though you may be also. See, if Christ ascends to heaven as the obedient man and secures it, That's one thing. We can say, I too can look forward to joining him someday. With confidence, we say goodbye to our sister Jan Hale. But yet, if Christ stays in heaven and waits for each of us to make our journey to heaven then our lives are lived between now and then as proverbial orphans in this world, away from Christ, away from home, away from the Father. And this is why this verse is so encouraging. <laughs> that he will come and receive us to himself, that where he is we may be also. You see what Jesus is saying? He's not saying, look, I'm coming back in 2,000 years. Hang on, I'll be back. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> no, he's saying, I'm leaving, I'll be back shortly to return to you. To bring you the comfort of my presence. It would be torture to live the Christian life without Christ. Sealed to your heart. Be torture. That would be abandonment. It would be comfortless. It would be the life of an orphan. But you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I will secure a home in heaven for you. Number one, I go to prepare a place. But number two, I'll bring heaven back to you. The taste of heaven. 
the baked cookies, the letters, right? I'll be back to receive you to myself. He will not stay away. The heavenly one will come to you from home and bring home to you. Bring heaven to you. Bring himself to you. That's the great comfort to his disciples, to all of God's children who believe in Jesus Christ, who turn away from their own works and trust in what he's accomplished and him alone. They have the twofold comfort. Or as Catechism Question 49 puts it, a double guarantee. Catechism Question 49, second says, We have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ our head will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. Yes. But third, he says he sends his spirit to us on earth, a further guarantee. So that by the Spirit's power we may not make not earthly things, but the things above the goal of our lives. Christ secures heaven for you through his cross as he ascends to heaven. Christ brings heaven to you by coming to you in the Holy Spirit. You will not be left behind. Is orphans. Yes, your hearts will be troubled. Your hearts will be troubled in this world because that's the nature of the world. In the world, you'll have tribulation. It's the nature of it. But you can have comfort. No, not, not the carnal comfort of some idolatrous creature comfort. Not by giving you more of what you want here on earth. Oh, if I only had that, then I'd be okay. Oh, if I just get this, then I'll be okay. Then I'll be good. Then you get it, and then you say, well, there's something else I need to get to. <laughs> and then you get that. You say, well, wait a minute, there's something else. You know, you know, how, you know how it works. You don't need to belabor it. But your hearts will be troubled here. And in a sense, it's good that your hearts are troubled here because that's the catalyst. If your hearts weren't troubled here, what? I'm good. <laughs> But if your hearts are troubled here, then it's the catalyst to look upward to Christ. To look to him, to believe in him. He who has secured heaven for you, not in this world. He who will bring heaven to you in the Holy Spirit. So that your trust in Christ is the true satisfaction the true comfort of the soul. It's kind of like this. Not, a, not any old letter comforts the heart of the soldier. Not just some store-bought cookies will comfort the heart of the college student. Not just some off-the-shelf spanking brand new smelling like some kind of paint thinner animal. No, it's the one that smells like me, that's got my saliva on it, that's got my hugs all over it, and the stitching is coming out in the side. That's comfort. No, not any old comfort will bring comfort. It must be the true comfort. It's the comfort that Christ brings from heaven to his children. Believe it. That's what Jesus said. You believe in God. Believe me now. Believe this. He's accomplished it. He will return. He will get you through to your proper home because he will go with you and comfort you along the way with his own presence. Thomas says, well, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. See what Thomas, the, the literalist, the earthbound Thomas, you're going away? Where? This way? This way? Damascus? Uh, Egypt? Uh, where are you going? We don't know which way you're going. 
Which way? If you tell us, then okay, then we might know the way. But if you don't tell us which way you're going, then, or where you're going, then we don't know the way there. If you're going to Egypt and I head to Damascus, then you won't be there. Which way are you going? May I at one time say, don't be like Thomas. <laughs> don't be like Thomas. <laughs> Listen. He's going to heaven. And you know the way. Jesus says what? He comes to Thomas. Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. Stop looking for the way. I, I'm it. I'm the terminus in me. I am, as John's gospel over and over, ego I me over and over in John's gospel. I'm in the Father. The Father is in me because he is I am. And I am the way. Look to me, Thomas. Look to me, the way through the world to your destination in heaven. I am the truth. I am the replacement reality of Old Testament shadows and types. I am the truth in opposition to all earthly lies that sell you a bill of goods saying, this is it, this is the real deal. And it isn't. I am the life. I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus had said, eternal life, the life of heaven, the resurrection life, the eternal heavenly life. I will go with you. Look to me, Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Get your eyes on Jesus. The way to heaven, through the cross. The truth in a world of lies. The life in the city of death. Lift up your eyes from earth to heaven, from self to Christ from being troubled to being comforted. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas, get those earthly cobwebs out. Get that heavenly clarity in. By looking, by faith to Christ, he is leaving you, but he is returning to you in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to dwell with you so that you will be in him and he will be in you. See what he says in verses 16 through 18. I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you, Christ. He was there with you. And he will be in you. It's an advancement. <laughs> the Christ with you will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. And because Christ comes to us in the Holy Spirit, as believers in Jesus Christ. Just as the catechism question says, he sends his spirit to us on earth by a further guarantee by the spirit's power. That's the resurrection power of Christ in the spirit. We make the goal of our lives, not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is sitting at God's right hand. So all believers have trouble that weigh them down. And the trouble that weighs us down tempts us to look inward and to bring out our little violins and gather together the people to celebrate the pity party of me. And we tend, we tend to feel abandoned by God. We all do. When trouble won't leave, it won't stop. That trouble is a catalyst in our lives to quit all creature comforts, to look to Christ, to look to Christ and says, look, I don't disappoint. I don't disappoint. Stop thinking. 
stop acting like orphans. Instead, look above. You've trusted in God, trust in me. I've secured the Father's house for you by way of the cross, and I will be with you. Heaven will be your destination, and the comforts of heaven will precede your arrival in my presence. Be comforted with this. Christ intercedes in heaven, and he comforts us upon the earth. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Amen? Amen. 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 Father.